Good morning. <laughs> it's a very lively group this morning. We bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, this morning, would you please rise with me in preparation for worship and sing our worship preparation hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, hymn number 53. Please rise. Well, good morning. It's a beautiful Independence Day weekend morning, and I just want to wish you a happy Independence Day. And aren't we thankful this morning that we live in a country where we can worship our Lord freely? Um, thank you, Lord, for giving us freedom. We want to welcome you to our morning service of worship, and we also want to welcome those who are uh, watching through our live simulcast online. Um, in case you didn't notice, I'm not Pastor Campbell. Uh, Pastor Campbell is enjoying a few days off uh, this week, a well-deserved break. Uh, my name is Jeff Carufi, and I'm one of the ruling elders here at the church. Um, please allow me to highlight a few important announcements for this week. Uh, since it's, it is a holiday weekend, uh, we will not be having communion service this morning. Uh, and also, this evening, we will not be holding our evening Vesper service. So uh, please don't come back to the church at 6 o'clock uh, this evening because you won't find us here. Um, however, the Vesper services will uh, resume next Sunday evening, and uh, Dr. Tom Starkey is going to be um, 
presenting our fifth doctrinal lesson on the, the, the doctrine of the perseverance or the preservation of the saints. And so we're very much looking forward to his teaching on that important subject. Uh, the men's book study, which normally meets on Monday evenings, will not meet this week. Uh, they will resume next Monday evening on the 11th. However, the women's book study will meet on Thursday evening at 7 p.m., and I believe the, there is an address, I believe, in the bulletin. Um, the youth Bible study, uh, led by Jack Stoffer, will resume this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., so for all of you youth who have been missing Jack, he's back, and uh, that's exciting for everyone, including him. Uh, and next Sunday, Sunday school will resume at 9.30 as usual. Um, one more quick note, and I apologize for so many announcements. Um, notes for the college student care packages will be due at the latest next Sunday on July 10th. So if you'd like to uh, put a nice note in to some of our college students, um, there is a collection basket that is out in the narthex. So maybe on your way out today, if you think to do that, that would be a great thing uh, for you to do. Okay, well undoubtedly... Uh, it has been a busy and chaotic week uh, for many of you, uh, maybe most of you, but as we gather together now with God's people in his house, it's time for us to quiet our hearts, to put aside all the things that have happened this week and all of our concerns and focus upon him. So why don't we take a few moments now in silent prayer and meditation to just uh, prepare ourselves to worship the Lord. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from Psalm 103, verses 15 to 18. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And it knows, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Let us worship the Lord together now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the great God. We thank you for your glory and your majesty, Lord. We give you praise and adoration, Lord, not only because you created the heavens and the earth, but because you also created each one of us. And you created us in your image. And though you created us in your image, Lord, we are really nothing like you. We are frail. We are finite. And we are imperfect and sinful. But Lord, we thank you this morning that you chose to set your love upon us. That you chose to draw us near to your steadfast love. Your everlasting love, which is indeed... Uh, for our children and our children's children. And God, we thank you for the covenant that you have established with the Son to redeem a people to yourself. And God, in our frailty and in our weakness, I pray that we would look to you this morning, that we would look for your hand of mercy and grace upon our lives, and that we would turn to you to satisfy our every need. And Lord God, as we, as we come to you this morning, we, we bring our concerns. There are many, Lord. We pray this morning for the leaders of our nation. We pray for our president, our vice president, the Congress, our governor and the leaders, the local leaders, even here in Anderson. God, I pray that you would grant them godly wisdom so that we might lead and live peaceable lives. I pray, God, that you would, um, that you would protect us from evil and from the evil one. Um, and, and all of his workings that, 
that try to undermine um, what you do and what you accomplish in the earth. We thank you that he's unable to do that, that you are the sovereign Lord. And Lord, we just, um, we do give you thanks for the recent ruling that came out of the Supreme Court, Lord. And God, I pray that, uh, Lord, that uh, this would be a, a first step in, uh, in bringing to end the, the wickedness of abortion. And I pray, God, and uh, pray for forgiveness uh, for our nation in the, in the ways that we have uh, strayed from you. I pray that you would grant us peace and that you would grant us um, forgiveness for the ways that we have sinned. And Lord, there are many in our congregation here today, um, some who are with us and some who are not, um, who are going through very difficult times. We just, uh, we continue to pray for Greg and Beth Silver and their family and the loss of Philip. When we, we pray also, Lord, for um, Alan Saxon and the loss of Marilyn. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, comfort their families, Lord, uh, bring them peace. Uh, may they turn to you in their time of sorrow. May they, may they find your Holy Spirit to be their great comfort. And um, Lord, we pray also for those dealing with health issues. We pray this morning for, um, for uh, Alan and Jan Woody's son-in-law, uh, Chris, who is uh, still struggling with long COVID symptoms. I pray, God, that you would, uh, that you would heal him. And we also pray for, uh, we also pray uh, for the parents of Lisa Wortham, who are, who are also recovering from, from COVID. And I just pray that you would heal them quickly. For uh, Pastor Campbell and his, his diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, Lord, I pray that you would minimize his symptoms and that you would, um, Lord, that you would uh, help him to continue uh, to, to worship you and to provide this ministry of the preaching of the gospel to the people that you have entrusted to him. And Lord God, I pray also for my mother-in-law, Barbara, who is recovering from heart surgery. Lord, I pray that you would continue to heal her. Thank you for um, the fact that her infection is beginning to heal. And we just pray that you would um, release her from the hospital soon. God, most of all, we just give you praise for the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth in the form of a man to atone for our sins. And Lord, we, we now pray to you in the way that he taught us to pray, saying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand with me now and sing our hymn of adoration? Uh, this is my Father's World, hymn number 111.
of opportunity this morning to recite the great creed of our faith, one of the great creeds of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. So, Christian, I ask you this morning, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. He descended into hell. Third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We now have an opportunity to come to the Lord in silent confession of our sins. And I was reminded this week um, in preparing for this morning's service that the Lord calls us not to confess our sins in general, but rather that we confess our sins in particular, the specific ways in which we have violated the law of God. So I I encourage you this morning and, and really at all times that when you confess to the Lord and you come to Him with a heart of repentance, that you confess those things that are very specific. Um, For He hears our prayers, and He longs to forgive His people of their sins. So why don't we take a few moments in silent prayer to confess, and I'll close us in just a few moments. Father, we thank you that we can come to you confessing our sins, knowing that through the blood of Jesus Christ that you offer forgiveness. We just give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our assurance of pardon this morning comes to us from Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. Isn't that great news that the Lord will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea, separate from us, away from us, as far as the east is from the west. We can praise him for that this morning. Well, in the past weeks, we have been having weekly doctrinal lessons that come from the Shorter Catechism of the Westminster Confession of Faith. And uh, you may recall that last week, uh, Jack introduced uh, question 23, from which we learned that Christ is the only mediator between God and people. And in his role as mediator between God and people, the Lord Jesus fulfills three offices. He holds three different offices simultaneously. The office of prophet, the office of priest, and the office of king. And in the next three Sundays, starting from today, we're going to look a little more closely at those three offices in the next three questions of the Catechism. And uh, if you haven't done so, I would encourage you to read chapter 8 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is entitled, Of Christ the Mediator. And that chapter of the Confession does a great job of explaining Uh, Everything about Christ, his nature, his role as mediator in all of these offices, and and a whole lot more. Um, So today we will look at what it means that Christ is a prophet. Well, what is a prophet? Well, a prophet is someone who is sent from God to man to reveal God's will or to speak uh, God's words, much in the way that Moses and 
Isaiah and Jeremiah and other prophets of the Old Testament spoke to God's people and brought his word and his will to them. Jesus was also a prophet in his incarnate form when he was walking the earth. However, unlike all of the other prophets who preceded him, Jesus didn't come only to reveal God's will. He did that, obviously. He didn't come only to speak God's words. He did that, obviously. But he was the very word of God incarnate. In John uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So unlike the other prophets who preceded Jesus, none of them could ever lay claim to the fact that they were with the Father in the Father's bosom from all eternity past. None of them could say that except for our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, when he walked the earth, people recognized Jesus as a prophet. You remember in John chapter 4 when Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well and he tells her everything about her life and, and he basically tells her that he, know, that he knows that the man she's currently living with is not her husband. And her response to that was, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And likewise, if you were to ask, for example, a Muslim today, what do you think of Jesus? What is the nature of Jesus Christ? They would say, we think he's a great prophet. They recognize him as a prophet uh, in the line of Moses and the others. But these descriptions fall very short of what Jesus is, because he's more than just a, an earthly prophet. Before we read question 24, which speaks to this issue, I want you to listen to a couple of verses out of the Gospel of John and out of the book of Hebrews. In John 14, verses 5 and 6, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then later in the same chapter, in verse 26, Jesus speaking says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, the author of Hebrews writes, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So Father God has not appointed any of the other prophets to be the heir of all things, and he did not create the world through anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what is the revealed will of God that Jesus came to proclaim? Well, he came proclaiming through the word and spirit, the way to God, right? And also the word of God. So if you would please turn to me, with me to page 871 on the back of your Trinity hymnal, we will read question 24 together and respond uh, with the answer together in unison. So the question is, how doth Christ execute the office of a prophet? Christ executeth the office of prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for all salvation. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We now have an opportunity to praise the Lord through the giving of his tithes and our offerings. And if you, um, if you don't want to um, give uh, today, you can go online. There's a a link uh, there in the bulletin, and you can also give by texting.
we will next sing in preparation for our sermon this morning. We will sing our hymn of preparation, which is Speak, O Lord. And the words should be printed inside of your bulletin. In fact, that's our prayer this morning, that the Lord would, in fact, speak to us through His Word. And it's our pleasure this morning to welcome into the pulpit Mr. Caleb Evans. Uh, I must confess that I just met Caleb and his wife, Becca, this morning, and his son, Ezra. Uh, and, but apparently, many of you already know Caleb and Becca pretty well. So, um, but let me just uh, tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Caleb grew up in the upstate since he was about eight years old, and he graduated from Anderson University, where he was heavily influenced by the Reformed University Fellowship. In fact, I also learned this morning that he was a bit of a mentor to our very own Jack Stauffer. And so uh, he graduated in 2018 from Anderson in one weekend, and then he married his wife, Becca, the very next weekend. Is that correct? That's pretty impressive um, and probably really hectic. Uh, they now have an eight-month-old named Ezra who's here with us, uh, sitting there with Becca. Uh, and this past May, Caleb graduated with his Master of Divinity degree from the Re uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in, in Charlotte. And currently, he is serving as pastoral intern at our sister church, the Oconee Presbyterian Church over in Seneca. So, Caleb, we welcome you to the pulpit, and we look forward to hearing what God has to say through you. Well, greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at Oconee Presbyterian Church. What a joy it is to be here with you all today. Some new faces, but old faces as well. It's so always good to be here. Um, if you will, turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Psalm 90. We'll be looking at Psalm 90 today. 
Um, while you're turning there, I think it'd be helpful to give just a little bit of context for this psalm. Uh, as we're just kind of dropping into the psalms, we need to understand where we are. That Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, as it's described. So it's likely one of the oldest psalms that we have in our Bibles. We don't have the specific information on when it was written, but likely during Moses' wilderness wanderings with the people of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, You can pick and choose any time of rebellion or failure that would make an appropriate context for this psalm being written. But this psalm also opens up the fourth book of the Psalms. From Psalm 90 to 106 is the fourth book of Psalms. And all that book, book four, is in a sense a reply to the great lament, the great sorrow of Psalm 89. And Psalm 89 characterizes the fall of Jerusalem, the people being sent into exile, and then this is how the people are to respond. This is what they turn to first after that great event of exile. Thus, this is the first psalm that they're sought after. This is their foundation in times of distress and times of extreme pain. So with that context in mind, let us read Psalm 90, uh, beginning at verse 1. Listen now to God's holy and errant and inspired word. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream. Like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy or even by reason of strength eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Let's go before him together in prayer. Almighty Father, we praise you and thank you for your sovereign will and preserving so much for us, Lord, your word, that we might know your truth, that we might know you, we might know what you have done for your people through your Son. Lord, I pray that as we prepare to hear your word, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds to receive it, that we go forth from this place encouraged, convicted, and ready to live our lives for you. Father, I pray that you would get myself, the sinner, out of the way, and that only your truth, only your word would be proclaimed this morning. We pray these things in your Son's glorious name. Amen. Uh, In the beginning of my high school career, one of my best friends was involved in a serious car accident. Uh, By God's grace, he survived, but he was severely injured. Uh, He suffered major head trauma. He was almost completely scalped. Uh, One of his legs, all the ligaments in his knee down, got completely torn. Uh, His hand got smashed. His whole face and body was littered with glass that took almost years for all of it to come out. And yet, by God's grace, he lived. After several surgeries, several weeks in the hospital, and then several months of bed rest at home, he finally entered rehab. He had to relearn how to walk. He had to relearn how to use his offhand to eat, to brush his teeth, to feed himself. All these new things that he knew how to do, And yet after the accident, he had to relearn how to do all of these things. In a similar way here, Moses is taking us back to the basics, trying to reteach us the truth of theology about God. That Moses here finds hope even in the most dire of circumstances, even after a severe injury of the people being exiled from the land. That in a time of distress and uncertainty, these are the basics that we need to understand. We need to understand one about God, about ourselves, and about the world. 
And Moses does this in three ways in this psalm that we'll look at this morning. That first, he explains the nature of God. Then secondly, he explains the nature of man in contrast to God. And then thirdly, thirdly he explains the hope of man. And we see that all of this, Moses points out that without God, if you're on your own, without God, there's no ultimate hope in this life. No hope in this life or the next without God. So we'll be looking at those three points that Moses brings up here. First, the eternal nature of God. Moses teaches us the basics of the nature of God in verses 1 and 2. Look at your text starting at verse 1. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are a God. Moses begins this return to the basic of truth and the acknowledgement of God. He opens it up with the Lord, Adonai, that is master. And the psalm ends in that same way as well in verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God. This entire psalm is framed with the Lord in mind. It is all about him. He describes him as himself their dwelling place. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. And this would have been especially potent for the people in the wilderness. That they were wandering without a home. They were living in tents. The people now in exile, when this psalm was used, were wandering without a home, kicked out of their land. And yet, Moses says that God himself was their dwelling place. They didn't need a city. They didn't need a stronghold. That the Lord himself was their dwelling place. That they had in the tabernacle, they had the temple, the presence of God. And yet even that was not their ultimate dwelling place. The ultimate dwelling place was the Lord with them. That we have God with us today through his Holy Spirit. That we have the Lord as our dwelling place. That no matter where we are, no matter the circumstances we are facing, God is still our dwelling place. And he makes that clear. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. And he begins to discuss the eternal nature of God with this. That the basis for Moses' hope, the basis for his consolation, despite this sorrow, the basis for the people's consolation, despite their sorrow from being exiled from the land, is that God is their dwelling place in all generations. That he is eternal. He is always with them. He was the dwelling place for the Israelites for thousands of years. He's been the dwelling place for Christians for thousands of years. And will continue to be the dwelling place for his people for all eternity. It was not just Moses' generation, but every generation before and after that have experienced this, that God as their dwelling place. And this is exactly what Moses prays for the people in his farewell blessing, his farewell prayer, his farewell sermon. In Deuteronomy 32, 27, he says this. He says, the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. For the Christian, that is where you reside, under the everlasting arms of God. And he even uses this metaphor for uh, strength and for eternality. He compares God to the mountains that were brought forth in verse 2. He says, For before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are a God. That in ancient times, the mountains were used as imagery for stability and eternity. That when I look at these ancient ruins, you think of the great pyramids of Egypt or these other civilizations. They're the buildings that are still standing for thousands of years later. And yet, the mountains were created before them. And yet, even before the mountains, God was. He created the mountains. God's eternality extends beyond anything we can comprehend in this life. Our God has been there before it all and will continue to be there forever. And this is Moses' hope, his consolation in God. Because he knows that God's goodness and mercy has always been and will always be present for his people. He will be their dwelling place in all generations. And it's important for us to remember that. That if you're struggling to believe that God is still present with you in your sufferings, you need to remember that he is your dwelling place in all generations, in all sufferings, in all circumstances. If you're struggling to believe God could once again be gracious and merciful to you, who have sinned time and time again against him, remember he is your dwelling place in all generations, from everlasting to everlasting. Moses reminds us that the existence, the love, and the mercy of God will never expire. He will always be there. 
And this is Moses' great hope and consolation, that God is eternal and will always be present, no matter what we are facing. So after showing this eternal nature of God, the foundation of this psalm, the foundation of his consolation, he then contrasts that with the frailty of man. He shows the futility of trusting in anything other than a God, that God is eternal, and now he will show that man is not. We come to our second point, the temporal nature of man, in verses 3 through 11. While God is eternal and will never die, Moses makes clear that is not the same for man. That man will die and will return to dust. Look at verse 3. He says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. This idea of returning to dust echoes Genesis 3.19 where God curses Adam, says he shall toil and work for his food, and uh, and then says, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Man will not live forever. Your life will one day come to an end. And Moses was no stranger to this reality of death. He saw every single adult that he left Egypt with, several million, by best estimates, die except for Joshua and Caleb. Everyone that he knew, everyone that he was friends with, everyone he encountered and saw for years on end, he saw them die. This is the reality of life in this world. We all face this, that eventually we will come to an end. Death is what comes for all people. A time will come when you'll be sitting in, likely sitting in a doctor's office and they'll walk in and say, there's nothing more we can do. That is a reality that we all face as mankind. And he, it says in verse 4 that even a millennium in our time is almost nothing to God. It says, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. And if you think about all that's happened in the past thousand years, the kingdoms that have risen and fallen, the technological advancements, the medical advancements, all that has been a watch in the night, three to four hours in God's time. But he stands outside of time. He experiences all of time at once. That even the great life of Methuselah, who lived 969 years, was but a drop in the ocean of time for God. That we are not eternal like God is. We are temporal and our lives will come to an end. And Moses further makes this brevity of man's life abundantly clear through three metaphors in verses 5 and 6. He says, you sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. That even the pacing of the psalm here is fast. It shows the brevity of life, how quickly he progresses through each of the metaphors. He says man's life is swept away like a flood. That when rains come, when a dam breaks, and waters rush into a valley, it is completely swept away in almost in an instant. He says man's life is like a dream. I think this one is particularly relatable. I don't have dreams often, but when I do, they're always very vivid. I wake up remembering this, and man, that was either a really weird dream or a really cool dream, and I liked it. I'll always remember that. That was so fascinating. Then by the time I get ready, by the time I get breakfast, I can only ever remember about a single detail of the dream by that point. How quickly our memories, our dreams fade away. That is what he says is what man's life is like. How quickly it fades away. Then he compares man's life to the grass that rises up in the evening. It's renewed by the cool, renewed by the dew. And then morning comes, the scorching sun comes, and it dies. It withers away. That we all have faced times where we get that unexpected test result from a doctor. We get those dreaded phone calls from a loved one or a family member. That life can change or be lost in an instant. We are not guaranteed another day. Therefore, we need to be remindful of the reality that we will one day die. This is not to be morbid, but it is to understand our state as temporal beings. Those who live in a fallen world, that we are not eternal. We have a limited amount of time on this earth. Only God is eternal. We are not. So Moses makes clear that man's life is mortal. He's made that abundantly clear. But he goes further than that. He doesn't just explain that you are mortal. He explains why that's the case. Why is it that we are not eternal? Why is it that we will die? 
He explains the cause of the temporality of man's life in verses 7 and 8. He says, For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. That man still dies not because medical science has advanced and hasn't advanced enough or because people haven't found the right workout routine or the right diet. But notice the instrument by which man is brought to an end, as we just read in verse 7. It is by your anger, by your wrath, talking about God. It is God's very anger and wrath that we are brought to an end by. It is his justice that guarantees we'll be punished for our sins, for the wages of sin is death. And that is what we are promised in this life. That God's perfect justice is such that he must enact punishment on sin. That he cannot turn a blind eye towards it, or else he would not be perfectly just. He would not be God if he just let it go. That we wouldn't want to play a sport or a game with someone who doesn't follow the rules. We wouldn't want God to be unjust for us and then unjust for others who have committed horrible, wicked deeds, and yet they wouldn't be punished. That we have to be punished for our sins. And it says there, by your wrath we are dismayed. That imagery of dismayed is one being just psychologically overwhelmed. They can't do anything. You think of the famous adage of one who's frozen in place, shaking in their boots, that the fear that is overtaking them is so overwhelming they can't even move. And that is what we all face with God's wrath and with his anger. And that, this is, that is an appropriate response to God's justice for our sins, that we should be fearful that that is what we all justly deserve on our own standing with God. In Hebrews 10, 31, he says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing. But notice the reason for God's settled justice, the reason he must enact this justice against us is because he knows all of our secret sins. He knows all of our thoughts, all of the words, all the actions that we might have done and have done. Look at verse 8. It says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Imagine if there was a projector screen in heaven and for God to, to watch, and it constantly played all of your sinful thoughts, all of your sinful desires, all of your sinful actions. We would be horrified if our friends or family had that and got to see that. How much more should we be horrified that the ultimate, that the perfectly holy, just, and righteous God knows all of those? That he does see all of our sins. He does know all of our thoughts and desires. Therefore, he must be just and enact punishment against it. That is why there's death in this world, because of sin. And this cause is so important for us to understand, because the unbelieving person does not understand this cause. They see the wickedness of the world. They see the death of the world. They see sin of the world, though they might not call it that. But they don't understand why it has come about. It's come about because of Adam having fallen, because of our own sinful hearts committing our own sins as well. And Moses makes clear that this is the reason for suffering. This is the reason for death in this life. As much as our culture and society wants to deny it, it it's because of sin. So we are not eternal. We are mortal. It is because of our sinfulness. But more than that, even beyond that, Moses shows the type of death that we will experience as well in verses 9 through 11. That this is truly a depressing lot in life, to be under God's wrath like this. That so many desire to have this good death. In times past or displayed in movies, it might be dying gloriously in the field of battle, serving your country. For others, it might be dying doing what they love, though it might be dangerous. For others, it might be dying peacefully in bed, surrounded by loved ones. For others, it might be dying by accumulating wealth to leave a legacy for your family. Yet none of these are good deaths. Death is a curse. It was not natural to creation. It should not be that way. And all death ends in a whimper, not a bang, not a blaze of glory. Look at verse 9. It says, For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. There is no glorious death. It all ends in a sigh. That one can live 70, even up to 80 years, yet their time will come to an end and will all be in toil, as it says in verse 10. 
that some of you in this room might have broken those age barriers, or you have parents or grandparents that have broken those age barriers. Yet, as we see from the book of Ecclesiastes, all of life apart from God, it is full of toil, it is full of trouble, has no meaning, it is vanity of vanities, and it will come to an end. And then finally, Moses ends this section with a reflection on who actually considers these things of God and man. In verse 11, he says, Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? That the natural man does not understand God's wrath that is over them because they do not know God. They do not fear him. Now, Moses does not reflect on all these somber truths for the sake of being depressing. He reflects on man's mortality that we might understand our proper place in life in relation to God. That without the mercy of God, this is your lot in life. Without God's mercy, this is the end that we would all come to. To live perhaps till 80, to be subject to toil and trouble, and then to eventually be consumed by God's just wrath against us for our sins. That Moses is being honest here and giving light to the reality of man's station in life. That God is eternal, we are not We are mortal, we are sinful, and we are deserving of death and punishment. But after reflecting on God's eternal nature, after reflecting on on man's temporal nature, Moses responds to these truths with faith and hope in God. That even in this time of this depressing reality that we live in, Moses has hope and faith in God. So we see thirdly in our text here today, the hope for man in verses 12 through 17. That Moses is not left in a dark and depressing mood. He knows that this is his lot, that this is his reality in life. But rather than staying there, he shifts his focus back to God. To find the hope even in this reality of his mortality. Even in this reality of the toil and troubles of this life. What we have here in verses 12 through 17, Moses makes six pleas or requests to God. And in these six pleas or requests, we see a reversal of man's temporal state in verses 3 through 11, that all the things that were wrong and bad in those verses, we see reversed and being blessed and being glorified in verses 12 through 17. The first request that Moses makes is that Moses would remember this lesson that he just talked about, this brevity, the mortality of man's life. Look at verse 12. He says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Moses does not want to forget, wants to constantly be reminded that man's life will end. There are many medieval philosophers and theologians that are depicted in paintings and are are known to have had uh, human skulls sitting on their shelves or their desks wherever they studied and did work. And this was not to be uh, morbid. It was not because they celebrated death. Rather, they had them there to remind themselves of the brevity of their own life, their own mortality, that they wanted to use all their time, knowing that it would come to an end, to honor and serve God. That the purpose of knowing our days is limited is to have the wisdom of God. As Proverbs 9 and 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. We have this knowledge of God, that He is eternal, this knowledge of us that we are not, that is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of insight. And for those of you who have experienced God's mercy, we need to ask ourselves, are we using our time wisely for the Lord? Do we understand this reality? Are we numbering our days? Are we remembering that it will one day come to an end? That we are not promised tomorrow. Thus, we need to be living every day for God's glory. Not only our own pleasure, not only our own enjoyment, but using it for God. That have you spent time this last week encouraging one who may be downcast? Have you spent time this past week proclaiming God's truth to someone who might not know it? If you keep saying, I'll do that later, I'll get to that when I'm less busy, you might not ever get to it. You might not ever get that later time in life. That we need to do the things now to serve and honor the Lord with the time that he has given us now. And it is this heart of wisdom, this understanding of God and ourselves, that teaches us the great news that we can also receive mercy from God. Look at verse 13. It says, Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Yes, God is just, and we are justly deserving of his wrath. 
but he is also merciful to those whom he chooses to be merciful. God delights to show mercy and steadfast love to his people. As one pastor put it, he said, the God who returns sinners to dust is willing to return to sinners in mercy. And Moses makes this a truth, makes this truth a reality when he cries out to God with his covenantal name there. Return, O Lord, that is Yahweh, the covenantal name for God. That Moses knows God can return in mercy not only because he delights to do so, not only because there's more grace in God than there is sin in you, but because God has promised to do so. That if we call upon God in faith and confession of our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That yes, we are deserving of God's wrath and punishment, but if we cry out to him in faith and repentance, he will have mercy. That He will return to us in mercy rather than returning us to dust. And we see this also in Moses' third plea in verse 14. It says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. The steadfast love that Moses pleased to be filled with there, in the Hebrew, that's his hesed love, that's his covenantal, personal love with his chosen people. And as we've seen before, it's eternal. If God is love and God is eternal, then his love is eternal as well. God is merciful and loving and eternal. We can be confident that he will be eternally merciful to those who cry out to him in faith and repentance. That rather than being swept away, rather than being renewed for only part of the day and fading as we saw in verses 5 and 6, that we will have life in God. That we will not be returned to dust, as it says. That Moses' plea for God's love to sustain him all our days. It is not that Moses' situation or circumstances have changed. There's still going to be a death. There's still going to be toil in this life. But no matter the circumstances, no matter the sorrows, no matter the pains that we are facing, we can be satisfied. We can even be joyful in God's love for us. And that's what Moses pleased for, is that we would have that love and joy in God because of the mercy he has given to us. That we have every reason to rejoice and be glad in God, even if all we have is his steadfast love. If that's all we have in this life, that is still more than enough reason to be joyful to be rejoicing and praising God. That our joy and comfort in our joy and comfort in God, even in the difficulties of life, should be a witness to the world of the God that we serve. And it's not just in the good times, it is not just when we're healthy, not just when we're doing well financially, not just when our kids are behaving, not just when everything is going our way in life, that we can be joyful. It is in all times. Look at verse 15. It says, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. This is a reversal of what we saw in verse 9, where all of our days were toil and trouble, but now all of our days can be filled with joy, can be filled with gladness. And yet those two also go together. That Christians grieve, Christians have sorrow. That the psalm here, the, the entire book of Psalms is filled with those emotional expressions of sorrow, of depression, of grief, of sadness. And yet all the Psalms, except one, end in joy, end in praising unto God, end in being focused back unto God and reminded of the love and mercy that he has for us. Therefore, our lives too, though it be mixed with sorrow, though it be mixed with grief, can have joy in God. And then Moses makes his last two pleas that deal with God's work and a plea for the work of man as well. Look at verse 16 and 17. It says, Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Moses here asks that God's work will be shown to his people and to their children. And the work of God has already been displayed to Moses and the Israelites. They've been delivered from Egypt. But that work was just a picture, was just a foretaste of the ultimate work, the ultimate deliverance that they would experience in Christ. That the salvation from Egypt was a salvation, but it pointed forward to the ultimate salvation in Christ alone. That we are not ultimately delivered from foreign enemies, 
We're not ultimately delivered from trials in this life. We're not ultimately delivered from financial burdens, from health issues, from betrayals, from friends. No, the ultimate deliverance that we need is from the very wrath of God, from the curse of sin. That's what we need to be delivered from, as we saw in verses 7 through 8. That's what sin causes, is death in this life. And that's what we need to be delivered from. And brothers and sisters, that is precisely what Christ came to do for you. That through his work on the cross, he delivers you from this life of toil and trouble and death. He gives you new life in him and that life eternal. It was Christ who took that wrath upon himself and paid the price for our sins so that we did not have to because we could not pay that price. I love how Moses describes him here in verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. He begins saying, Lord, you have been merciful. And then he says, Lord, you are our God. That he would show mercy to us while we were still sinners. The extent of his love for us, that he would send his son to die for us. And this leads to the ultimate favor and beauty of God, not only in this life, but in the life to come. That the Lord is is what establishes all of our toil and work in life. So it doesn't happen what it says in verse 10, that it won't be full of toil and trouble, but rather the Lord will bless our work, will bless our living for him and serving him. This is the hope of man that Moses describes here. Even in the midst of the sorrows of this life, even in the midst of the reality of the death of this life, there is hope and there is life in God. And this psalm that Moses here shows that even the hardships, the sorrows, the uncertainties, these are the truths we need to be reminded of. That we need to be reminded of God's eternal nature. We need to be reminded that we are not eternal, that we are sinful, we will die, we justly so. And yet we have hope in God. For anyone here who does not profess Christ, you need to understand these realities. This is the truth of the world that we live in. You cannot outlive God. You cannot outrun his wrath. That life is ultimately fleeting without God. So I implore you, if you have not given your life to Christ, if you have not prayed in faith and confession of your sins unto him, that you would do so even today. That you might not suffer under the weight of God's wrath and curse, but you would turn to God in mercy. For he has made clear in Hebrews, he says, For it is appointed once for man to die, then comes judgment that you must repent, you must turn unto Christ today, you might not get a tomorrow to do that. If you want to be delivered from God's wrath, you want to be delivered from the sorrow of this life, it is only through Christ. And then for those of you who have professed Christ, we still need to be reminded of these truths, be reminded of your frailty in the face of God, that he is eternal, we are not, that we were deserving, we were under God's wrath and punishment And yet by the blood of Christ, we have been washed, we have been made clean, and we have life and peace with God. And if that is your reality, if that is your true state in life, how could you do anything but rejoice? Even in the days of sorrow, even in the days of pain, even in the days of hurt, there's always room for joy in Christ. Because we have been redeemed, we have been made new in God. And ultimately, as he said in the beginning of this psalm, because the Lord is our dwelling place in all generations. That is the hope that we can have as Christians. Amen. Let us go before our Lord together in prayer. O Holy Father, we praise you and thank you for the truths that you have reminded us of here this morning. Father, we thank you that you are eternal. We thank you that your mercy and your love will never end. Father, we know that we are sinful creatures who are deserving of your wrath, and yet through your grace, through your mercy, you have sent your Son, that we might have redemption through him. Father, what a truth, what a joyous truth, what a hopeful truth. Father, I pray that you would remind us of these even in the times of great sorrow, even in the loss of loved ones, even in the times when we don't want to find joy in you, Lord knowing that this life is full of toil and trouble, that we still have hope in you, that we can still praise your name because your steadfast love never ends, because you are our dwelling place in all generations. We praise you and thank you for this truth. It's in your son's holy and righteous name that we pray. 
Amen. Thank you, Caleb, for your careful preparation of God's Word, and what a great message um, from the Psalms. Now, if you would please rise with me and sing our hymn of response in response to the great Word that, that was just presented to us, hymn number 30, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Please rise and sing with me. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this time that we have had to gather together to worship your name. And now, God, we pray that you would go with your people, that you would uh, give us a heart to count our days, Lord. Help us to make use of our days that we might glorify you in all that we say and do this week. And we pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.